This is Twit. Uh, Courser has an all-in-one website where you can pick all of the things, all of the widgets, all of the tubing and plumbing and tanks and uh it's just a it's it's you forget if you haven't done liquid cooling custom liquid cooling right because the last few years it's all been about um closed systems where you get a box and inside the box is a pump slash heat sink with tubing attached to a radiator um you uh you know you're looking at like a, a cold plate a fluid chamber um, and then a whole bunch of tubing and couplings. Was, I mean, how did you enjoy the process of specking this out and building? Did you miss anything when you specced it out the first time and have to order more parts? Because uh, a big thing about this is that they have this fairly sophisticated website, we talked about it before, that walks you through, I have this processor and I, I have this GPU and I want to connect this and this and this to the liquid cooling system. Yeah, and Was it goes it a little fun? bit more than that because they also ask you what case you have exactly what motherboard you have and try to figure out what you can fit in your case and for me i went through all of this and i didn't really provide a case because i was working with uh, corsair on this actually before it was officially launched mm-hmm. and while i had this stuff in-house uh during the month of uh Rizember, as i called it the end of june into the beginning of july when i was doing nothing but cpu testing I had to put it on the back burner until that was all over. But then I realized I was kind of uh, I was procrastinating because I'd never done a liquid. I've never done custom liquid cooling before. And it was intimidating. And it's it's not for the faint of heart. Although I will say, like, as I was going through everything and making sure I like laid it all out and did some rough measurements and figure out what the length of tubing I'd need. And it, it became uh, a lot easier because of just the realization hitting, like I'm doing all of this dry. Like you don't, in, you don't add any liquid to the loop until you're completely done building the loop, and everything is nicely connected, and you've double checked all of your seals. There's still a little bit of of fear because I just went for it and threw it on my rare and you know impossible to find Ryzen nine thirty nine hundred X, and right. grabbed of course the most expensive GPU I have here, which is a uh, RTX 2080 Ti Founders Edition. I said, "Hey, what the heck? I'll rip the stock cooler off of this GPU and slap a water block on it." And never done this before. It was very easy, <laughs> though. And I will say, once I figured out how to get the Founders Edition uh, cooler off, which it turns out is a simple matter of just taking the back plate off, removing some screws on the back uh, I/O panel, and then pulling. I was attempting to disassemble the entire thing at once, which was a mistake. But once you get through, you know, the, the setup and the planning stage, and like you mentioned, like making sure you have all the right fittings and stuff. And I, I only asked for flexible tubing. I did not want to, as my first attempt ever, also have to deal with rigid tubing. So right. just flexible stuff, which left me some room for error, along with the fact that I was using some different... Uh, types of adapters, one of which was like a 45 degree angle adapter that was, you could rotate 360 degrees. So I had a little bit of extra reach when I needed it. But just to kind of briefly go over what the parts are, they, they provide a single pump and reservoir combo, no matter what you do as far as specking out your system. There's only one. They don't have a separate right. reservoir or a separate pump. So that's that's it. Like Then there's different radiators. There's two different thicknesses of radiators they offer. And, and thicker radiators are generally better. I know fin, fin density matters a lot. We could go into fin density versus radiator thickness and uh, th- like the pressure from your fans and then push versus pull and then push pull and all that other stuff. Some of the same stuff that we've talked about with liquid coolers that were all-in-one closed-loop coolers for the last decade or so. And of course, right. Corsair has been at the forefront of those. Like the H100 was kind of what brought those to the forefront. As I know, it was. It's been almost a decade, I think, since the the H100 was really kind of changing how people viewed liquid cooling, and it was far more effective than a lot of the air coolers of that time, because this yeah. is in an era before the giant, just ridiculously efficient, ultra quiet coolers like. The Noctua NHD 14s of the world were out there, and the Silver, the Silver Arrow, I think, from Thermal Right. 
And of course, now we have giant like be quiet coolers like the Dark Rock Pro 4, very similar to like a Noctua D15, which is the current one, I believe, well, or is there a D16 by now? But let's pause for a second, right? Because yeah. a classic at this point, and, and we'll talk about it more in a, in a couple minutes. Like, you know, thirty-five dollars, you get a Cooler Master Hyper 212 or Hyper 212 Evo CPU cooler. It's an yeah. air cooler. It's not particularly huge. It uses copper heat pipes. Uh, it's got sort of a copper, if memory serves, it's copper and aluminum on the base. Blade of Matos yeah. be less, uh, just aluminum. Um, it's, it's copper because it's those direct contact pipes. Yeah. There's four pipes, and they just directly contact the CPU. If you're not overclocking at the far end of the extreme of you know some sort of 140-watt CPU, it probably has enough thermal capacity to do whatever you want it to do. Fan might get a little loud, but the fan doesn't get particularly loud. Um, you know, it's amazing how much cooling you get for thirty-five dollars. You know, when you were looking at at this system, you know, were you thinking, "Gosh, I'm going to have this amazing," you know, because I feel like this choice was more for aesthetics than it was for sort of real world performance. Um, and it's kind of probably going to irritate Corsair me saying that, but you know, well, I like liquid yeah. coolers. I have liquid coolers. You know, anything I plan on overclocking the snot out of, I tend to put a, a, a closed loop liquid cooler on it just because I like having more thermal capacity than I can use. Um, but if you're not overclocking, this is almost entirely an aesthetic choice. I will say yes with the one condition that with GPUs, that's not the case. Okay. With with a CPU, you you're absolutely right. You can get a cooler like the Hyper 212 Evo, which you know, even though it's not a loud cooler, it is around 44, mm -hmm. 45 dB if you really push it. If the fan is glowing close to 100, percent but with closed loop coolers, when you're comparing those to larger air coolers, there's less of an argument. It it becomes far less compelling because at some point you just run out of fluid in the loop, and if right. you are really really pushing a CPU. And you're getting close to that TJ Maxx temperature where it's actually going to start throttling the CPU under extreme load. Then at some point, the liquid in that loop becomes hot enough that it's no longer effective at cooling the CPU. Just like at some point, you right. run out of space like to put the heat on your heat sink. At some point, the pipes have just reached <laughs> a certain temperature. They've been saturated. Those, those yeah, it's, it, there's nowhere else for it to go. So the, the idea there, if if that's what the limit you're hitting, then building a large loop where you have a lot of tubing and a, a, a reservoir and multiple radiators, there's a lot more liquid. And so the overall temperature of the liquid takes a lot longer to get to that point of no return. So there's one mm -hmm. advantage. If you were right. just pushing your system 100% 24-7, you would run into that thermal limit a lot later, if ever, with a custom system than you would with, you know, conventional options. But, you know, the, the CPU temperatures that I, I saw from this, while considerably lower, and I was only looking at mm -hmm. it versus my initial findings with this R9-3900X with the, the stock cooler, the, the Wraith Prism that it shipped with, which obviously is not what any enthusiast is going to do if they're even potentially going to be overclocking this thing. And I hadn't done any overclocking sure. testing yet, but it went from 89 degrees under load, which is high mm -hmm. to about 75. So it was like 74. That's a so big it was about jump. A, it, That's a huge it's delta. It's a big jump. And I would expect a similar jump if I were to go to a very large air cooler as well. Maybe not quite that much. And I've got to do that testing still, but okay. the huge, huge difference was with the GPU. And imagine, like, if you're thinking about it, the CPU has its own heat spreader on it. And there's internal, some sort of internal compound, whether it's silver solder or some sort of thermal paste between mm -hmm. the heat spreader that you actually see and the dye that's down beneath. And there's different schools of thoughts about, about this. And people have absolutely delitted their CPUs to take that heat spreader off, put their own thermal compound on, or actually just put a heat sink directly up against the die, which is dangerous because you always risk cracking the die. <laughs> so, uh, you know, be that as it may, a GPU, when I took the stock cooler off of this uh, RTX 2080 Ti, that's a bare GPU die. And when you put a water block on your bare GPU die, you are exposing it to the absolute best thermals you can probably ever get out of that PCB. 
and that GPU. And that's where the huge, huge difference was, where under load before removing the stock cooler on an open test bench like this one, in about a 25 degree room Celsius, I was getting between 75 and 77 C under load. And that's with the fans ramping up nicely and it was staying under 80, and which is fine. It was never throttling, but you know, you, you start to hear the fans and right. you know, high seventies for a very high performance GPU like that is great, but you put that inside of a case, you don't have the best airflow. It's going to be a lot higher than that. Cause again, open test bench. I put this, the GPU block on it, ran it in this system my loads went down to 47 to 48 C with the same benchmarks Whoa. in the same room. So we're talking 30 degrees cooler with the same GPU. And it's just remarkable. Like the, the amount of headroom you gain from water cooling your GPU, like putting a full block on it where your VRMs, the memory and the GPU itself are all being water cooled and direct contact like that. It's just, phenomenal the difference so you know i didn't i didn't produce the most impressive loop ever it was a very simple loop uh i could have added a second radiator to it although i wasn't overclocking so there was no real need for that my system is what corsair would consider a level one they do three different levels level two would be like your quiet but with overclocking uh capabilities like where they had a second radiator and then you can go crazy with multiple radiators and mm -hmm. push pull fans and go as nuts as you want to go but with just a single 360 rad and 328 millimeter fans i mean 48 degrees under load from the gpu was just nuts it blew my mind uh and it looks amazing because it's it's like you said it's it's as much about aesthetics really as performance but with gpu it's just it's not even close and i i have Recently, we talked about that EVGA. Uh, it was a 2080 Super, but it was their Hydro Edition where it has an all-in-one 120 uh, millimeter closed loop connected to the GPU. And then mm -hmm. because it's a hybrid, it has a fan that still cools the VRMs and the memory, but it's it, the difference is night and day. It's even with an all-in-one connected to the GPU like that, going underwater completely takes it to another level. However, the loop that I put together cost as much as a 2080 Super. So, I mean, <laughs> you're looking at around six to $700 to put together what I did if you buy and all this is, the parts we, from scratch. And, and we should point out, I think, I, you know, I think you said it was like um, around, it was like $617 was the configuration you put together um, on their website and you yeah. compared that to uh you know if, if you pulled together uh, an ek loop uh that priced out between 710 and 780 dollars depending on where you put it so yeah. this is competitive it's a single yeah. source um they have the configurator to make your life easy mostly uh easy easiest i should probably suggest if you're using a corsair case uh do they have non-corsair case options on that oh yeah yeah okay good the uh it was, it was surprising you know, like they had fantex stuff one of the guys on our site last night was was specking one out for his fantex case and he said there was a bunch of different vendors on there not everything has a picture like you're not going to be able to visualize it the same way as you would mm -hmm. with corsair's stuff when you're right. looking at it because their configurator uh if you for audio listeners the ek configurator if you've ever visited their site i think they were first with that it's mostly like black text on a white page. You have a few diagrams, right. a few examples when you when you wrap it up and look at the total build costs and stuff. But Corsair's is one of those highly that seems polished. Reasonable. <laughs> yeah, Corsair's is is different. It's it's very polished. Looks like an app. It's like a web app running in your browser that has the ability to kind of go back and forth more easily and visualize what it is you've built so far and where the radiators ra radiators are. And lets you go back and like change, uh, like the cooling level, or maybe change which fans you pick, because they they you can start off with just plain fans, or do single LED colored fans, or those really cool like addressable RGB fans where each fan has I think eight different lights in it that can individually be changed. Well, I mean, it was so, kind of nuts. I think you have one hundred and thirty dollars in RGB fans in this, or maybe one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. You know, so adds it, to the it adds up. I, and I also say, as somebody who spent like $180 on a water block for a CPU, 
you know, 15 years ago. You know, these prices are not bad. These are, this is this is not something, you know, this this is not something that's going to scale the same way, uh, you know, an entry level CPU cooler is going. Um, you gave this the uh, the gold award, if memory serves. Um, did you? I mean, you know, now that you've done it once, do you, do you feel calm and comfortable about this, or or do you think you would be just as nervous going into a build like this in the future, putting water would, inside of your expensive computer? <laughs> I would have no qualms doing it again. The only thing that bugs me is uh, taking it all apart, uh, right. draining it, and safely disconnecting everything and making sure you don't spill any water on anything. Because, like I said, I you build it all dry, you make sure all the connections are tight. And then you fill it and kind of pray. And you've, there's paper towel galore covering everything where there might be drips. And <laughs> like looking. And, uh, the first night, I couldn't go to sleep that night because I'd started uh, this, the loop running. And then I kept running right. back and checking all my paper towels, making sure there weren't any drips. And finally, I just like, oh, I, I guess I can trust this until the morning. And it takes a long time to get the bubbles out. I mean, there's different techniques to get bubbles right. out. And I got almost all of them out, but there was... Still, some micro bubbles in the reservoir. Even when I was doing my they testing, they will bother so. you forever. <laughs> yes, they don't look as as nice as I'd like them to look in photos. But I just I dealt with it. I kept waiting and waiting. Like I'm not gonna take a picture of the res until all those bubbles are gone. Then I just gave in. Pro tip: If you uh, do get water on a motherboard, which is terrifying, uh, yank the power cable out of the power supply, and don't yes. use a a, a hair dryer. To try to get the moisture out of there, uh, use a a vacuum instead, but only one with plastic fittings on the end. Because sometimes, if you use a blow dryer, it can force water underneath components in a place that they will be enormously difficult to dry. Um, you know, but most of the time, shutting the machine off, letting it sit for 24 hours, will let everything dry inside of there. Uh, you know, if you decide to put it into an oven to dry it, which I'm not too stoked about, but I know people who have done it. Um, be real careful about how high you turn the temperatures up <laughs> because nothing says uh-oh like wiping out the family stove with a uh yeah a terrible uh, a terrible motherboard uh burning incident yeah because if you have the kind of family where they walk up to the stove and oh this must be warming something and turn it up to 450 to bake something it's going to get nasty 